All right, I want to talk to you about something that I call the true gospel this morning. Um, I'm, I'm driven in part by something summarized beautifully by the great reformer Martin Luther and um, the late great Brennan Manning. Martin Luther said, it seems a small matter to mingle the law and the gospel, faith and works, but it creates more mischief than a man's brain can conceive. We have unfortunately become the victims of a mischief um, in the very place where we ought to be saved from that mischief. Which is this wonderful thing that Jesus tried to begin that we have unfortunately um, to a great degree adulterated and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Not always with malicious intent but sometimes just because the way that we think, the way we perceive things causes us to misinterpret or reinterpret and come to a different conclusion about certain things. Brennan Manning said this, I love it, we try to dim the blinding brightness of its true meaning because the gospel seems too good to be true. And so when you blend those two things together, you see why the mischief came because the blinding light of the gospel is almost too good to be true. Uh, But my life is driven by not being afraid of that blinding light and uh, being willing to allow it to be too good to be true. The problem is that I've had to let go a lot of things that I carried through with me in my Christian experience in order to let that gospel have blinding brightness. But that's where I am and we'll talk some about that this morning. I don't know if you understand it, but the term Christian only occurs three times in the whole of the Bible. Um... The believers in Jesus and his message were first called Christians at Antioch. You find that in Acts chapter 11 verse 26. Which really means this, that Jesus wasn't a Christian. Was he? And and right there is the problem. That what has happened is that that title stuck and with it begun to slide into religion and institutionalization. Um, I don't know if you appreciate it, but actually when that term was first used in Antioch, it was not a term of affirmation of these people, or these people are Christians. It was a, a derogatory term. They were mocking them by denoting them to be Christian. Now what, what is fascinating is that although they were called Christian in Antioch, they, that, that first bursting out organic thing that we know as the church in its emergent state uh, was not known as the Christian church. They were known as people of the way. Uh, And I rather like that because it denotes that the real understanding of the gospel is a direction in which you live, not a place to which you go. And with the distortion of the gospel, we have reduced it to what I call destinational theology. You either go to hell or you go to heaven and Jesus is in the middle and you decide. So we have two destinations and a decision. That is not true Christianity. That is not the true gospel. The true gospel is directional, not destinational. It means that you set your life to live in a certain direction. Jesus didn't say go to heaven. He said follow me. That's a direction. He said and if you follow me, I'll make you what you need to be. Now, that does not suggest that there are not destinational ends in all this. Now, we could talk for a long time about our perceptions of those ends and what we mean by heaven, what we mean by hell, but that's not for today. But unless we understand that that the true gospel is not destinational but directional, we miss the whole point of the gospel in our lives, right? Right? That the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, so that heaven could live in us and be part of us. Because in you today, the word has become flesh and dwells among us and we see the glory of the Father. Now, it's not so bright in some of us and sometimes it looks a little troublesome, but nevertheless, the glory of the Father is still there. So... In understanding this, um, I want to ask you some questions. When it comes to your understanding and grasp of the gospel, would you classify yourself as a milk drinker or a meat eater? Would you classify yourself as immature or mature? 
would you say that you are a weaker brother or a stronger brother? Now, your focus will have probably settled on, on the three questions. You know, milk or meat, mature, immature, weaker, stronger. When actually the answer to those three questions rests in your approach to the preceding proposition, which I said in your understanding and grasp of the gospel. You see, you first of all have to look at your understanding and grasp of the gospel before you can answer those three questions. So our problem is not where do I sit in those three questions. The, the, the question is what is your understanding and grasp of the gospel? Because if you deal with that, the answer to these three questions will naturally take their course because of the direction in which you now live. So... That leads us to the question, what does spiritual maturity look like according to Scripture? So we're going to have a little look at that. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11 through 14 will help us with the first part of those questions. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 11 through 14, I'm going to read it from the NIV. We have much to say about this. But it is hard to explain because you are slow to learn. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk and not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, because you live on milk, listen to this, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. So the difference between a milk drinker and a meat eater hinges on your acquaintance with the teaching about righteousness. Now, this is where it gets very important. Most of us, in fact I could say that all of us, were raised with an acquaintance with the teaching about unrighteousness. Everything we were ever given in school, in society, in church, was a teaching about unrighteousness. How you recognize unrighteousness, how you must deal with unrighteousness. How unrighteousness defines you in the presence of God. Well, here's what Hebrews says, that shows you're still an infant. It shows you're still drinking milk, and that's why most of the church still behaves like children. Because we're still drinking milk. Because we're not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. So he goes on in verse 14 to say, But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Now let's break that down a little more. Knowing what we know about being acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. I'm going to add a little bit into that verse. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use of the solid food of the truth of the gospel of righteousness have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil, but not on the basis of right and wrong. So when you understand the gospel of righteousness, you don't distinguish good from evil on the basis of, is it right or is it wrong? We were never created to have that tension in our lives. That's why God said, don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, You'll die because you can't handle it. That tension in your life to decide what's good and what's evil, what's right and what's wrong was never built into the human psyche. So when we ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, we stretched ourselves into an arena that we were never created for. But whatever you follow that track, it's going to bring you always to a gospel of unrighteousness because it's about good and evil and right and wrong. We were created to know the difference between good and evil, not on the basis of right and wrong, but on the basis of recognizing the life and the presence of God in every situation. Which means that judgments change when the viewpoint is from life, rather than when the viewpoint is from right and wrong and good and evil, because what are you going to define? You know, we don't have courts of law where we prosecute people for being righteous. We don't say, we're going to take you to law 
so that we can make a declaration over you that you've done nothing wrong, you're righteous. We only have courts of law, we only have declarations that all the time focuses on unrighteousness, good and evil, based on right and wrong. So unless our basic premise changes, we can be no different with each other, or in the church, and therefore our message can be no different. So all we have done is turn the church into a huge courtroom with judgments about good and evil based on a system of right and wrong. And so we declare things over the nation and over people's lives which are not appropriate and did not come from the heart of God. It came just from the church. But why are we doing it? Because we're childish. Why are we childish? Because we're not acquainted with the teaching on righteousness. So we behave like children and we make people think that God behaves like a petulant child. Oh, I'm upset by that. I'm not talking to you now. Those are my toys. Give me them back. I'm not going to share with you because you're not my friend anymore. Now, I'm just using different language. We get more religious with our language, but that's what we make God to be in the eyes of the world, a petulant child who lives by a teaching of unrighteousness. Okay, so let's go to the second one. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, teaches us how to recognize someone who has not understood the teaching about righteousness by showing us what an immature understanding of the gospel looks like. So here's what it says, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, again from the NIV. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ. Okay? The, we teach elementary education to children, right? It's just for children. We don't teach it to adults. We just teach it to children. Because they've got to grow beyond that elementary education. Okay? So we take them into some greater understanding past their elementary phase. Well, here the writer of Hebrews says that we have to leave the elementary teachings about Christ. Now remember, he's already associated being an infant with drinking milk, with not being acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. So, so we're on the same theme. Let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. Remember we said immature or mature, milk drink and meat eater. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that leads to death, number one, of faith in God, number two, of instruction about baptisms, number three, of the laying on of hands, number four, of the resurrection of the dead, number five, and of eternal judgment, number six, and God permitting, we will do so. So here the writer gives us six specific focal points that define elementary teaching and therefore immaturity. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but the whole gamut of evangelical understanding of the gospel begins with repentance from acts that leads to death and ends with eternal judgment. Would that be a fair assessment? So you and I, if you were raised in church, were raised with this. If you weren't raised in church, this is all you've ever heard from Christian television or from the evangelists that have spoken to you. It starts with repentance from acts that lead to death and it finishes with eternal judgment. Now, this is not me telling you this. This is scripture telling you this in the book of Hebrews that that's immature, that's elementary, but it summarizes evangelical theology. Now, that ought to scare the living daylights out of you. That somehow we may have missed the point somewhere along the track. Somehow we may have stopped short of the blinding light of the glory of the gospel because it seems too good to be true. And this allows us theologically not to go there. Where well, you've got to repent and the judgment is coming. That is not the true gospel. That's the immature, first elementary understandings of it, but it spreads both ways. How do we get to repentance? What defines repentance? Do we repent to be forgiven? 
Or are we forgiven whether we repent or not? Do we, is repentance the response to forgiveness or the initiator of forgiveness? See, we're going back this way now from repentance. We're looking at that. Then the other way, eternal judgment, what do we mean by that? And how much do we believe that eternal judgment rested on the head of Jesus when he gave his life on the cross and said, it is finished? How much do we believe that when the temple veil was torn from top to bottom to show, first of all, that, that the established institutional religion had no presence there at all, it was all a sham, but also to show that every man, woman, boy and girl of every breed, every culture, every country could freely enter into the presence of God because of the sacrifice of Jesus with nobody on the door saying, I've got to check your credentials to see whether you're going to come in or not. The temple veil was torn and you could walk in whoever you were, whatever condition you were in, whether you said prayers of repentance or whether you just said, I'd like to have a look in here. Lovely. It doesn't, doesn't say... The veil was torn and God put an angel on the entrance then to question you about whether you could come in. Simply says, come. If you're the slightest bit interested or intrigued in discovering the glory of God, just come. So, so the issue is, once that has happened, we, we have a different view. We believe it is finished. But you see, the problem is then, for generations, the church has been trying to stitch up the curtain again. We like to stitch it up to where we can just peek over and say, mm-hmm, well, I'm in, but unfortunately, you're out. But I have the secret to let you in. But first, you have to convince me that you're worthy to be let in. What kind of gospel does that sound like? Hey? Rubbish. It's English rubbish. Yeah. British English rubbish. Okay, let's look at the third one. Weak and strong brother. First Corinthians eight verse nine through ten. Okay, I'm gonna do this again from the NIV, first Corinthians eight, verse nine through ten. Be careful, however. That the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge. Oh, that's an interesting statement, isn't it? Which knowledge? <laughs> See, we, we read these scriptures and we go away and say, Oh, the Bible says that you mustn't let anybody who's weak see you eating the meat that's previously been offered in sacrifice to an idol. That's not what it says. It says, if anyone sees you who have this knowledge, eating at an idol's temple. So first of all, we have to say there is a knowledge involved here that is permitting the freedoms that are expressed. What is that knowledge? It's the knowledge of the teaching about righteousness that says no flipping meat offered to an idol has the slightest impact upon my life. I'm going to go and eat it because it can't affect me. I am the light of the world. I am the kingdom of God. And when I step into the idol's temple, the idol's temple is no longer an idol's temple. Right? It's the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ because of those who bear the kingdom in this world. So, so there's a point here being made that anyone with a weak conscience who sees you have this knowledge, that's the knowledge we've talked about. That knowledge means that you are no longer a milk drinker, you're a meat eater, you're no longer immature, but you're mature. So if they see you eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols. Now, we, we could teach for a whole morning about this one scripture, but I have a question for you. If you are a Christian, believer, person of the way, eating meat offered to idols in an idol's temple, who's going to have a problem with that? Just your regular Joe in the regular world, or the religious people... 
who already decided it's not appropriate to do that? Who's going to have the problem? Who's going to get in your face and say, you shouldn't be doing that? You are causing me to sin. It's not your regular person off the street because they don't know and they don't care. So what you have here in our, in our terms is it's the religious church goer who says you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't be here, you shouldn't be there, you shouldn't watch that, you should watch this, don't drink this, don't drink that. Who is it who does all the complaining? So therefore I propose to you the weaker brother is not this person who just came from a life on the streets who found Jesus and is loving Jesus. They're not going to complain at all. It's you. Whinging and complaining and pointing out. Because we didn't appreciate the strength and the power of the kingdom. And also, we have not appreciated where our righteousness comes from and doesn't come from. So although we say the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, it's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. You try and eat something somebody doesn't think you should eat and drink something somebody don't think you should drink. And you'll soon find out whether believe it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Because we have to say with most of the church, it is about what you eat. It is about what you drink. It is about what you watch. I mean, heck, can't even watch Disney movies for some people. Or oh, don't watch Frozen, it's promoting lesbianism. <laughs> really? I wondered why I was feeling the way I was feeling. Do you know what? As soon as I watched that, all I wanted to do is put on a dress. <laughs> it's like, come on. So, see, because of the teaching of unrighteousness, you and I have been trained to live in that place, recognize unrighteousness, get stuck in what is a narrow view of the gospel, and then misunderstand what is the weaker and the stronger brother. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay? So the answer to those questions rests in what I said to you at the beginning. What is your understanding of the gospel? How do you conceive the gospel? Because if you get the right gospel, those things are naturally going to fall into place in your life. Okay? So yeah, you know, it says about won't he be emboldened to to eat what's been sacrificed to idols. And the truth is, if they do that, it's because they do it without faith in where righteousness comes from. We are still hung up that like unrighteousness is when you do something wrong and righteousness is when you do something right. That's not the Bible's interpretation of righteousness. That's the Bible's interpretation of good works. That's the Bible's interpretation of self-righteousness. I'm righteous because I didn't. I'm righteous because I do. No, that's got nothing to do with righteous. That's to do with self-righteousness. It's to do with defining your own righteousness. The whole point of the gospel is you'll struggle for a lifetime to define your righteousness, but if you rest in what Jesus has done for you, your righteousness is already defined. I am so flipping righteous, it's scary. I mean, I am, seriously. I am. Because my God tells me I'm totally righteous. I couldn't be any more righteous than I am because I'm clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Therefore, I'm totally righteous. Now, again, it's another conversation as to whether sinfulness and righteousness or sinlessness and righteousness are not the same thing. I've got to just digress just for one second. Was Abraham righteous? How righteous was he? Was Abraham sinless? So Abraham's righteousness was not connected to his sinlessness. Therefore, Abraham's sinfulness did not impact upon his righteousness. Come on, think with me. Right? This is easy. Was Jesus righteous? Was Jesus sinless? But was Jesus righteous because he was sinless? No. He was righteous by the same criteria that Abraham was righteous. How was Abraham righteous? Abraham believed God. It was counted to him as righteousness. 
Which means this, Abraham simply believed that God was who God said that he was. And that he was simply who God said that he was. And how was Jesus righteous? Because he believed that God was who he said that he was, the Father. And that he was who God said that he was, his son. Done. So the wonderful thing in this is that it does not mean that we should sin. Should we sin therefore that grace may abound? No. But it does mean you have to understand that your sin and righteousness are not connected in any way whatsoever. Right? Sinlessness does not make you righteous and sinfulness does not make you unrighteous. That's a completely different debate. It's another message. But you see, if you have only been taught in the gospel of unrighteousness, the two are connected. I'm unrighteous because I sin. God says, I don't even want to talk about your unrighteousness. I just want to talk about your righteousness. And then we'll deal with the other stuff in due course. Which means you have a lot more grace for people. Because how can you call someone unclean who God has called clean? Changes your whole approach. Another message. Come back. Okay, we're here. So my favorite, well, no, my second favorite verse in the whole of the Bible. My, my favorite verse is why I talk to you about a directional gospel rather than a destinational gospel. My favorite verse is Hebrews 11 verse 8. Abraham, when called by God to go to a land that he would afterwards receive for an inheritance, got up and went not knowing where he was going. That to me is the essence of kingdom truth. We hear God, we get up, we go. It's a direction. Then we don't get stuck on all the things that come in because we start making destinations. We get free just to follow Jesus and we get free to live something called life rather than being focused on death. Oh, I came to Jesus, so when I die, I'm going to heaven. I'm not thinking about when I die, going anywhere. That's not the point. Jesus didn't say, I've come to sort out when you die. I've come to give you the solution because you're not going to be around long. But when you do die, here's the deal. He said, I've come that you might have. Right? See, and you don't hear in the message of Jesus anywhere that he's preparing anybody for death. If you find it, you tell me where it is. not preparing anybody for death. What he's doing is bringing life to everybody. I am the life. I am the light. I'm the breath. I'm the water. I'm the wine. So... It becomes direction. We live in the power of that. And then we finish up where we finish up. I don't really care that much about heaven because that's not my business to care too much about that. Just to live the direction of the kingdom and know that whatever it is and wherever it is and however it looks, it's going to be fine. So, here's my second favorite verse. Romans 1 verse 17. For in the gospel... A righteousness from God is revealed, okay? That's the whole point of the gospel. Not in the gospel, you'll find out how to get to heaven. No. In the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. That's about not how we die, but how we live. We live in a righteousness revealed. It changes our life now. It brings the kingdom here. In the gospel, and of course you know what the word gospel means... Right, And it's part of my beef and argument, which I, I never can pass that word without saying it irritates me. Because we all know it means good news, so why not just say good news? In the good news, and I think I've told you before, the reason we invent words, church is another invented word that's not in the text of the Bible. And uh, it may surprise you, but hell is another invented word. Right? But the reason we don't want to call it good news, because first of all, it would have to be good, and it would also have to be news. <laughs> so if we call it gospel, we can get away with stuff that's neither good nor news. <laughs> and, and a lot of the gospel I was raised with is not good, because it introduced me to a God who preaches a gospel of unrighteousness. It wasn't good. It was scary. I, I grew most of my young life terrified. Jesus is coming. And he better not find you in the movie theater. He better not find you in a pub. He better not find you reading a Sunday magazine. He better not. I was fear. We were terrified. So, so it wasn't good. And nor was it news. Because I could flip right through the Old Testament. And find numerous 
expressions of that kind of God. Neither good nor new. So, so if in Christ we have been given the good news, it has to be good and it has to be news. And it is. That, but only if you, don't, if you don't cover the blinding light of the gospel, which sounds too good to be true. So in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. I like to tell people this. Righteousness is a revelation. That's all it is. A revelation And when you get the revelation, you think, hey, I'm righteous. Because it's a revelation. What did you do to get it? Nothing. What can you do to lose it? Nothing. Because it's a revelation. A revelation is something that you become aware of, that you were not aware of, that was never put in place because of your awareness or contribution, and therefore still remains in place regardless of your awareness or contribution. But when you get aware of it, it's like, I'm righteous. God says I'm righteous. I may not be sinless, but I'm righteous. I think that's a good place to start. And and See, the whole essence of the good news is start here, right? Totally righteous. And then we'll let all the other stuff get sorted. Some of it might never get sorted before you pass from this life to the next. And uh, you know what God's going to say about that? Hey, you're righteous. Well, I come with a bit of baggage. Yep. (laughs) Been really stupid. I know. But you're righteous. It's not God that's going to be shocked with us. It's us that's going to be shocked with him. And nobody going to stand in the presence of God and say, Oh, you're more forgiving than I thought you were. You're far more gracious than I imagined. Nobody's going to say that. We're all going to go, even those of us who grasp something about righteousness are going to say, Wow, you mean it was that big? You mean it was that open? I wish I'd known that when I was back down there. It's a righteousness revealed that is by faith from first to last. Not like the gospel that was preached to me, you know, that um, uh, by grace you're saved, not by works lest any man should boast. Uh, And then the moment I received that, then they told me all the rules that I had to keep (laughs) and all the ways that I had to live in order for God to stay happy with me. See, it's another gospel. A righteousness from God revealed. Where does it come from? Not from you, not from your behavior, not from your doctrine. It comes from God. And when you find that God, and he's really there because, I don't know how many of you have read the shack. How many of you have read the shack? When Mac first goes to the shack, it's broken down and it's busted up and and it's old and it's decrepit. And you went there hoping to meet God and get so angry. I knew you wouldn't be here. I knew you wouldn't help me. Smashes the chair, storms out. And then when he's leaving, of course, he turns around and the shack has completely changed. And now smoke's coming out of the chimney and wonderful spell. And, and I, love what, I love what he wrote there. that Because that God who Mac went first to see never existed in the first place. And, and I have to say to some of you, I hope you don't think I'm arrogant, but the God that you've gone to meet has never existed. He's the fabrication of institutionalized religion that we now put the title of Christianity over, but nevertheless, we use that as the justification to create a God who never existed. This is the God who exists, the God out of the fullness of his heart who reveals righteousness to you. Got a revelation. Now, what were you told that God wanted to reveal to you? Your sin. Yeah? But here it says, no, God came to reveal to you your righteousness because of him. So, so things take a different order when we understand this, okay? I'm trying to be a little passionate about this, but I'll do my best. I almost believe it. A righteousness which is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by what? Faith. Just by faith. Only by faith. But that doesn't mean by faith that, well, bless God, we have no butter, but God will send us butter tomorrow. Bless God. Doesn't mean that kind of... 
It means faith in the righteousness revealed that it's more than enough. That's where our faith rests, okay? So then we go to, from that, to look at another scripture because what I'm trying to get you to understand is the central issue of the gospel is not unrighteousness. So if that's the central part of your message, stop it. It's not the central issue of the gospel, unrighteousness. So now we look at very interesting um, comments that Jesus made in John chapter 16 and beginning at verse 8. John 16 and verse 8. I'm going to read some of it from the New King James and some of it from the NIV, okay? Um, in New King James is better, and I'll show you why in a moment, okay? But let, let's just look at it. Verse 8 from John 16 in the New King James. When he, that's the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict, It's an interesting word, convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Now, what does that statement suggest to you? It doesn't suggest good things, does it? You know, whenever we were introduced to the word conviction, it was like, you better worry. Under conviction, you better work. Come under conviction. You better start work. Do I need to worry? Yes, you need to worry. You're under conviction. So all of these things have a negative connotation in our religious mind. Convicted, right? Of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And I want you to see what the NIV does here because it's awful. It's an unmitigated disaster. <laughs> Listen, NIV says when he comes, Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, there's the problem because guilt in regard to are not in the text. But the problem is I understand why the translators of the text who were primarily evangelical translated the text this way because whenever we hear the word conviction, we attach to it the word guilt. Right? Because it's a negative conviction. He will convict the world of guilt. So we're all going around guilty because we feel convicted and then we think that that's really spiritual because bless God, we're just so convicted about our sins so we're going to spend the next three weeks before the Lord in prayer and fasting and seeking God to cleanse us. And then, of course, you know, not meaning to be upset and, and to cleanse our nation. Why? Because it's convicted of guilt in regards to sin. I don't personally like fasting too much. It makes me hungry and I don't, <laughs> I don't like to be hungry. So I struggle a bit with fasting. So when he comes, when he the Holy Spirit has come, he'll convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment, okay? So guilt in regard to is not in the text, but it expresses the sentiment driving most evangelical belief models, okay? So here's what happens. We invariably, we read the word righteousness, but subconsciously we hear the word unrighteousness because this is the way that we think. So we're here to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But what we're hearing in here is he'll convict the world of sin, unrighteousness, and judgment. But look at your Bible. That's not what it says. It's not what it says. And some of you ought to be really angry now because some of us were raised most of our lifetime believing this nonsense because we heard unrighteousness, the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of sin, unrighteousness, and therefore judgment on that unrighteousness. And it's really sad because that's not what it says. But it's kind of what I was told it said and it's what I thought it said. Now the most scary thing is not whether I was told that. The scary thing is, is that when I read it, that's what I think because that's worse than somebody telling me that. It means now my understanding and grasp of the gospel only allows me to be fully familiar with the teaching about unrighteousness. So everything I read reflects the teaching of unrighteousness, convicted of sin, unrighteousness, even though it doesn't say it, and judgment on that unrighteousness. But that's not what it says. Okay? In fact, the text means the exact opposite. So... It's good news. 
So let me do the text for you. When he, the Holy Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. Okay. Now the question is, what does that mean? If you've been given destinational theology, all you think it's, yeah, because you have to believe in Jesus to get to heaven. That's not what he means. If you believe in me... It's the very expression of who I am and what I came to do, which is clarified in the next statement in verse 10. In regards to righteousness, not unrighteousness, in regard to righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. Now, of course, here's the wonderful thing. If I, me, Jesus, was going to the Father and we know that he gave his life for the sins of the world, it had to mean that whatever it was that he did in his work on the cross meant that he could go straight back to the presence of the Father and that there was no reason why he could not now sit at the right hand of the Father, full of grace and truth, administering the kingdom, because if he got back to the Father, sin was completely, totally and absolutely dealt with in humanity, never to trouble them again. So in regards to righteousness, because I'm going to the Father. In other words, his ascension and seated at the right hand of the Father was the confirmation that righteousness was at the core of the gospel. Because God saw him as righteous, and he's the representation of Adam's race. So God now sees Adam's race as righteous, because in Adam all die, but in Christ all are made alive. So now the declaration doesn't hit us, in Adam you died. The declaration hits us, in Christ you made alive. And just remember, Jesus is not an alternative to the to first Adam. It says he is the last Adam. First and last Adam. He brought the new order. He instigated a new covenant, which we now live under. So, it says then in regard to judgment, verse 11, because the prince of this world is judged, stands condemned. So the judgment there has got nothing whatsoever to do with you and I. We don't get a sniff. We're not on the scene. But you see, if you don't understand this, you're thinking, yet yeah, of sin, the sin that I've committed because I haven't really trusted in him, of my unrighteousness and therefore the judgment that's coming on me because of my unrighteousness because I didn't believe in him, Right? When actually what it really means when you tie that together, it's in regards to sin because we don't believe that he has done what is necessary to convict us of righteousness by going and sitting with the Father and transferring all judgment onto the prince of this world and not onto us. So the issue is, is we have been convicted. You are under conviction today. The Holy Spirit came and says, I am holding court for the Father and for the Son. I am the representative judge of the Father and the Son today. I speak as the paraclete, not the parakeet. Although what they do is very similar. You know, a parakeet will say what you've said to the parakeet. The paraclete says what the Father says to the paraclete, so it's easy to be confused. Whether the Holy Spirit sits on a perch or sits on your shoulder, which he does. <laughs> Sorry, I'm messing with you. He says, I, the paraclete is one who legally speaks. So now he pronounces judgment from the Father, okay? That's what's going to be. We'll convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And the Holy Spirit brings the gavel down and says, World, I convict you. You are convicted of righteousness by the Father. And I sentence you to be free from condemnation. From this day on and forever. No condemnation is your sentence, but your conviction is Righteous. You have been convicted righteous. I don't care whether you like that or not. (laughs) You can't sit in the court of law and say, well, you know, your honor, your majesty, or whatever you call them here. Judge. You can't do that. It says, really? This is my court. I know the law. I'll do what the heck I like. So Holy Spirit comes and says, I convict the world. That's, hang on. To convict the world. 
He will convict the world. He will convict the world. Not a few people in an evangelical church who said, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to go into my life. And... Though that has value. He will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin in regards to believing in him because he's done all that is necessary, that the righteousness comes because of him. And now the prince of this world is the one who stands condemned. So we, like it or not, stand convicted today of righteousness. And when anybody comes to you and says, I don't accept it, you say, well, I'm sorry, but the judge in the highest court of the heavens has passed his verdict. He took all the evidence into account. And you're thinking, oh, this is not going to go well. He says, having considered all the evidence and listened to the jury, Jesus and the Father, and their comments on the evidence, I'm now going to make my decision. I convict you righteous. In the face of all the evidence, regardless of all the evidence, I convict you righteous because the evidence of what my son did is greater than the evidence of your life trying to undo what you were created to be. Greater evidence. So judge and jury have convicted you righteous. Now here's the problem. We have been convicted righteous, yet the church has for centuries been appealing against that sentence. We're lodging an appeal. You can't tell us we're righteous. We've seen the truth about ourselves. I'm sorry, but we're going to lodge an appeal. And if that appeal is unsuccessful, we'll lodge another appeal. And so through the centuries, the church has been appealing that sentence. Stop it! Just ask, well, okay, then you say I'm totally righteous and completely righteous or nothing. That you've passed your judgment and I'm in life. Well, okay, then. If that's the way things are, I'll just have to get used to living with it. Do you know one of the reasons we don't like it? Because we don't want the world to be convicted of righteousness. We want the world to be convicted of unrighteousness. We want to spend our time pointing out the errors in the nation, the sins of the nation, the judgment of God on the nation. Because we kind of like that, because that separates us from them. And if we can call them unrighteous, then we can call ourselves righteous. But that's a righteousness which is of ourselves. It's the same righteousness that Eve had in the beginning. I want to know the right and wrong and good and evil so I can define my own righteousness is what Eve was doing. And the church still wants to live there, but not me and hopefully not us. It's convicted the world of righteousness. And so if you've got an appeal that has been lodged against that truth, withdraw your appeal. Get happy. God so loved the world. So what is the true gospel? It's right down this track. I'm going to give you a couple more thoughts before I just shut up. In 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, here's what it says in the New King James. Be diligent to present yourself for proof to God. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. And then this very interesting statement, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, If we are trained in the gospel of unrighteousness, we have to rephrase that. So, for example, one of the ways we rephrase it, who does not be ashamed, but who correctly handles the word of truth. Because we've not appreciated that you actually need to realize there there are two concepts that you can draw within the narrative of Scripture that take you down two different paths of understanding about what it says here about the word of truth. How can you divide the word of truth? Does that mean that within the word that is truth, you can come to two different conclusions? Well, if you've been around in the church as long as I have, you realize a lot of people can come to 30 different conclusions. Still the word of truth. Now that word divide is interesting because it means to make a straight, comprehensive or decisive decisive cut as if by a single stroke to dissect in order to set forth truthfully without perversion or distortion but you have to say that's not it this is it now why this is is important is for this reason 
that the use of that word divide implies two possible directions or understandings emerge from the beginning of the Bible narrative and the story of man that we must identify and therefore divide. Have you ever noticed how many twos are in the Bible? Two trees. Two sons happens over and over and over and over again. Two brides. Two mountains. Two covenants. Two blood sheddings in the beginning. Two birds coming out of Noah's ark. Two states of being, circumcised and uncircumcised. Two women, right? Two mountains. Two tabernacles. Two men. First Adam, last Adam. Two groups, the sheep and the goats. It comes up. Once I've told you this, you're going to see it all the time. The reason all these twos are there is because there are two ways to come at this thing. Now, of course, the conclusion is, without pushing that too, too um, uh, um, informally today, is that one direction of interpretation takes you always to law and sin and death and is based in all its doctrine on a revelation of unrighteousness. And you'll be able to track that now. The other one takes you to spirit and life and is based in all its doctrine on a revelation of righteousness. So we've kind of got two churches going on here. Now, thank God for the grace of God and the love of God and the power of God and the work of Jesus. People are still getting saved all over the world and it's absolutely amazing. That's not the conflict today, but the conflict is whichever way you go on these two things either leads you to a revelation of unrighteousness or a revelation of righteousness. And my hope this morning is to bring you to a revelation of righteousness. Because where your gospel ends up will determine how you divided the word of truth. That's what it's determined by. Okay? So let, let, me, let me bring this to a conclusion now. Uh, John summarized all that we've been talking about beautifully. John chapter 1. Um, I, I don't know if you've noticed it. Maybe you have. But Genesis chapter 1 and John chapter 1 begin in exactly the same way. In the beginning. So John's revelation in John chapter 1 is a reflection of the revelation recorded by Moses or whoever in Genesis chapter 1. So in Genesis chapter 1, we have in the beginning God. Now, here's the problem in rightly dividing the word of truth. If we're going to be accurate to the Hebrew, we would have to write in the beginning gods, plural, created the heavens and the earth. Now, for many reasons, you can understand why translators are just, we're not going there. We're just not, we're not going what does that mean, gods? In the beginning, gods. It's a plural word. In the beginning, gods. Now, of course, if you understand some concept of the Trinity, of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, you realize right in the very beginning, the Son and the Spirit are there with the Father. So it's a correct way to say, in the beginning, gods. Because it's kind of saying, well, he is the one God. He is the only God. But if we say that, you're not really going to understand who he is. Because he is also the Spirit, and he is also the Word who became the Son. So the only way we can describe him is, is we know him as the triune God, the three in one. He's plural and yet singular. So in the beginning, God's is accurate in Genesis. Now, now we come to John chapter 1, and John says, okay, let me throw some light on this. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of men. But the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us while this other part of God hadn't become flesh because he was still where he was doing the God thing who then we understand that Jesus said, well, the best way to understand him is let's call him Father. But John's trying to explain this. But, but the thing is, he's saying, the one who was made flesh is who? Was he with God in the beginning? Okay, totally. So when it says then, the word became flesh in verse 14 and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Right? We like that, don't we? The question is, was he full of grace and truth when he became flesh? Or was he full of grace and truth when he was in the Father in the beginning? Because you see, a gospel of unrighteousness says God saw the problem and the sin problem was so great and God had to have a solution. But when Jesus came, grace and truth came into the world. Not true. 
That's why John's saying, no, listen. It's just like when we read him later in chapter 16, when he says of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and we read of sinfulness, unrighteousness, and our judgment, he's making the same point. He's saying, no, wait a minute. You've got to understand this. He was full of grace and truth from before the world was ever created. So grace and truth was not God's answer to sin. Grace and truth was the expression of God's character. So he was always full of grace. He was always full of truth right from the very beginning. So right from the beginning, the gospel of righteousness was being preached. But humanity turned it into a gospel of unrighteousness by the choice of two trees, by not understanding two blood sheddings. Because incidentally, you may think that the first mention of shedding of blood was when an animal was, it doesn't say an animal was killed, but by implication, an animal was killed to present skins to cover Adam's sin. Yes? Now, one of the first shedding of blood. What happens when you open someone's side to remove a rib? What happens when you have to put someone to sleep to do that? Give them a general anesthetic. It means this is going to hurt and you're going to bleed. And Adam bore a scar in his side from the rib that was removed to create the solution to all of humanity's issues. The relational issue was resolved that day. See, the cross was not about God covering sin. It was about God reinstituting the relationship that really mattered. So you see, if you don't understand, all your thinking goes, okay, there was the tree... And then we had to kill animals to shed blood because we had to cover the unrighteousness of humanity. When God says, no, let's come back a step. Adam's rib was removed to establish the fellowship with the Godhead. For us to share in all that he is. So before all of that ever happened, before the fall ever happened, God had established the true gospel. See? So we now take a step back and say, well, if we step back before the fall, that means we were totally righteous. So therefore, the first shedding of blood was to show us you're totally righteous. Do you understand? The moment we go the other side, we're always battling unrighteousness and that's what we preach. But we're bringing people back to the rib and saying, do you know when Jesus was on the cross and the spear went up in his side, God was taking out a spiritual rib and he was doing something much more wonderful than just covering the sin of humanity that he was so distressed by. He was saying, look, listen, that's no big deal to me. Right? I've got the solution to that. The big deal to me is the restoration of a fellowship of righteousness that I want you to have. It all comes from the wound in the side. Is this making sense? So we're, we're just two minutes from being done. So, so when was he full of grace and truth? He was full of grace and truth from the beginning. Don't let your understanding of unrighteousness make you believe that grace just came when Jesus came in the flesh to pay the price of sin. He was full of grace from the beginning. God's always been full of grace. He knows nothing else other than grace. Everything he's ever done to resolve man's problem came out of his grace. Not out of his response to unrighteousness, but out of the expression of his righteousness. He's saying, here, have it, have it, have it. I'm giving it to you. So John 1 verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now notice it doesn't say grace and truth began with Jesus Christ. It says grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In other words, it was just funneled, channeled, brought into the world, but it already existed from the beginning. Of course, I know Ted says this, and I believe it, that it doesn't say the law and the truth, or the truth of the law was given through Moses. Because when you understand the gospel of righteousness, the law does not tell the truth about you. The law doesn't tell the truth about you. The law says you're a sinner, but grace says you're righteous. But if we don't understand how to divide the gospel and we're running by the law, we think the law tells the truth about humanity. Grace tells the truth about humanity. Righteous! Come on, why are you being so stupid? The courtroom session is over. The conviction has been declared. Judgment has been passed. Come on. 
So I'm done. Time's, time's done. Okay. I'll finish by saying this. Sin can't condemn us. But just as important, our sinning, our not sinning cannot save us either. Okay, if you understand this gospel, do you get that? Sin can't condemn us if we understand the gospel of righteousness. But just as important, our not sinning can't save us either. And this is the phrase that I want to finish with. You will not be measured by the good or the bad that you do, but by the grace you accept. Our message to the world is you will not be measured by the good or the bad that you do, but by the grace you accept. And so I bring you back to the very beginning and what I said from Brennan Manning, we try to dim the blinding brightness of the true meaning because the gospel seems too good to be true. If you do not understand the difference between the teaching on righteousness and unrighteousness, it will be too good to be true. But if you'll for one minute allow yourself to step into the power of this, it will set you free. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. In Jesus' name, amen.